I'm actually wearing outdoor clothes today. I'm wearing a bra and everything. You didn't need to know that, why did I say that? Hi guys, so welcome back again. I'm still around. It is Friday and I'm gonna try something different. So talking to you in the comments and things I've rambled on about in this video, my ring is stuck on my finger. That was not the news. Basically, it seems as though there is an appetite for me rambling on about fantasy novels. So what I'm going to do is the first and third Friday of every month, I'm going to do a fantasy feast. And this is the first Friday fantasy feast. F -f 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 so with these videos, I'm going to explore fantasy books that I've read a long time ago, sort of previously in my reading history words, not good today. Fantasy books that I've read more recently in the last 18 to 24 months or so that I've been on a little bit more of a fantasy kick. Any fantasy books that I'm reading at the moment and ones that I wish to read in the future. That far off, strange place that we know not of at the moment. I've got a lot of books to choose from on my shelves, so I've picked one that's seem mostly at random uh, that fit into these categories. So the first one for the first Friday Fantasy Feast, have I even said that the same way around every time in a row? Who knows? Is Brandon Sanderson's Elantris. Now I have got this funky old American style cover. The new covers are more in line with his, uh, what are they called? Stormlight Archive and Mistborn trilogy. They've reissued some of his older ones like Elantris and Warbreaker in similar covers, but I've got this cool, old style American almost pulp novel type and I love it. So because it was a good long time ago that I read this one and I'm talking maybe nearly 10 years, at least eight, I can't fully remember what it's about. Well, I can now because I've refreshed my memory by the wonders of Google. Uh, but yeah, so long ago I've read it that I picked it up and I was like, I know I loved this one. And I know that I read this one and Warbreaker in quick succession of each other. And I couldn't remember which was which, but that's my memory, not the books. So I had to Google to refresh my memory and I'm going to read one of the synopses is, is, is synopses off of, off of, off of, 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 the synopses from Brandon Sanderson's website, because this book, as with another book that I'll come to in a minute, does a thing that is one of my uh, peeves, uh, peeves in books is not actually giving you a synopsis on the back. It annoys me. I know I'm not alone in this. I've seen recently a few tweets and threads talking about this and it does kind of because it tells you a little bit about each one of the characters but it's not enough it's not enough so the godlike inhabitants of elantris once at the capital of the land aralon have degenerated into powerless tortured souls unable to die after the city's magic inexplicably broke 10 years earlier when the same curse strikes prince raodin of aralon and he's imprisoned in elantris he refuses to surrender to his grim fate and instead strives to create a society out of the fallen and to unlock the secret that will restore the city's glory meanwhile princess serenray of kai aralon's new capital who was betrothed to raodin sight unseen believes her intended has died Officially declared his widow, she must use her political savvy and wit to protect Kai from malevolent forces without and within the city, chiefly Hrathen, a leader of the creepy Shu Dereth faith, who aims to either convert Kai or destroy it within three months. Pretty sure I said Kai or Kai interchangeably there. Yeah, when I read that synopsis to refresh my memory, it brought it all back. The characters, Raiden and Serene, who I keep calling Saren Ray now, but that's just because I've been watching so much Critical Role. And Hrathen, who's just this creepy character and he's all dogmatic and religious and duh. And over the years, sort of, bits of this book have stuck with me, just sort of images, the imagery of, of what happens to um, the people's skin when they get the, is it the shower? The shower falls upon them and their skin goes this mottled, bruised, and it just, it's always stuck in my memory and I don't know why, but it means it's good, I guess. So yeah, and Brandon Sanderson is a name that you will probably know from things like Mistborn and the Stormlight Archive. He has been writing for years and he also wrote the last three of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, which will appear in these videos at some point, no doubt. I've read Warbreaker and I've read a few of his other short stories from that book of collected short stories that I've completely forgotten and I feel like that begins with an E as well. Arcanum Unbounded, that's it. So it's not an E, it's an A, it's a different vowel. I know the alphabet. I have also read the Mistborn series a long, long time ago and that is another one that bits of it have stayed with my brain and imagery and the way the magic works in it, but not sort of like the full details and it is one I think I will read, a series that I will go back to. One of the things I really like about Brandon Sanderson and to be fair, I don't think I remember it specifically from Elantris, more from his series, uh, the Mistborn series, is what I talked about before when I was mentioning uh, the Witcher series is that Brandon Sanderson knows his world. He knows his history, his geography, 
everything to do with his world. And it's more than just knowing the individual worlds within each story. Brandon Sanderson's stories are based in the Cosmere, which is essentially this, I, d I don't know the details of it and I'm gonna stuff it up, but it's essentially kind of like all these different worlds in different uh, planes of existence and things like that. And they all exist at the same time. And in some of his novels, characters will appear from others, just as sort of like little background characters and little nods to things, but things cross over. And Arcanum Unbounded deals with that a lot more, I believe, again, I've only read a few from the beginning of that collection. But essentially the whole point is that Brandon Sanderson is an author who knows his worlds, he knows his setup, but he doesn't beat you about the head with it. He knows what's going on, he kind of writes to you as though you know what's going on, that you know where you are, and for me personally that helps situate me slap bang in the middle of whatever world I'm reading. If you're telling me all of the history, like welcome to this world, here's everything you need to know. It's never going to be everything I need to know, it's going to be way more than I need to know. It's not the basics, it's not the essentials, it's not context, it's flab. I don't know. So yeah, Brandon Sanderson is great for getting it right. Now for the recent past, now this is a book that I've mentioned previously, I have now got my copy back because I'm going to reread it, and that is Samantha Shannon's The Orange Tree and the Priory. Now this is a chonker, but it's beautiful. So I've never read any Samantha Shannon before. I know she's got another trilogy, Bone Season, I think. I know it's got bones in it. This one, when it came out in hardback, I believe it came out in hardback just towards the end of my time working in the bookshop. And I was just like, ooh, magpie, magpie, magpie. But I resisted because I knew a hardback that big, I was never gonna get around to reading it. And I would wait. And I did, and I'm glad I did. So again, this is a book that does not really have a synopsis on the back. Lots of reviews. Three lines, a world divided, a queendom without an heir, an ancient enemy awakens, that's it. And it's great, I get that books wanna show off what other people have to say about them, but if a book is gonna get in my hands, you need to tell me what the book's about. So because I know that I could just waffle on and give you no real synopsis because I'd just be talking about how much I love this book, again, I will read you a synopsis from Tinternet. The House of Berethnet. The House of Berethnet has ruled Innis for a thousand years. Still unwed, Queen Sabran the Ninth must conceive a daughter to protect her realm from destruction, but assassins are getting closer to her door. Eid Durian is an outsider at court. Though she has risen to the position of lady in waiting, she is loyal to a hidden society of mages. Eid keeps a watchful eye on Sabran, secretly protecting her with forbidden magic. Across the Dark Sea, Tane has trained to be a dragon rider since she was a child, but is forced to make a choice that could see her life unravel. Meanwhile, the divided East and West refuse to parlay, and forces of chaos are rising from their sleep. Now this book... Bah! I wasn't 100% sure what to expect. I thought it was going to be a fairly run-of-the-mill fantasy epic, too much condensed into one book. I, I wasn't particularly... I was excited about it, but I was wary. I was so glad I was proved wrong. All three of the main characters are just... <laughs> They're in here. In, in this bit here. Just above the bra. Behind the bra. In my heart. They are, I hate, I hate using words like they're well-rounded female characters, but they are. They're just, they're fantastic. They're gutsy and they're glorious and they're just, I love them. This book has got everything. It's got your political intrigue in there, your plotting. It's got shadowy characters that you don't trust and you don't know who to trust. It's got your leaders that are flawed, but also you kind of root for them. There's characters that you don't like to start with until you really learn to learn about them and you end up loving them. It's got dragons, it's got cool dragons, it's got slightly different dragons from kind of the dragons you'd expect. They are, from what I can tell, dragons based more in sort of an Eastern mythology. And, and look, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, and that's my ignorance on there. And I'm trusting that Samantha Shannon did enough research to know this kind of stuff. You have to kind of take it on trust, I guess, as you do with all books, that, that people are doing things responsibly. I don't know. But the dragons are damn cool. The magic in there is so cool. I was gonna say dope then, like I'm an American teenager, but it's dope. And the relationships in there, to get a fantasy novel that has an LGBTQ relationship in there that doesn't feel contrived, it doesn't feel like it's pandering, it doesn't feel like it's kind of, there for the sake of it or there to tick a box or there to just as a, a kind of device to sell to people who want that i mean sure it, it works as all of those things i guess but it feels organic it feels right you're reading the story you're going well of course it was never going to happen any other way was it and the supporting characters as well are just amazing none of them feel kind of extraneous none of them feel superfluous they're all there for a reason and again they are all right on the money so yeah this was a book that as i say i was excited for but i was wary about and i was so pleasantly surprised so if you've been 
thinking about this one and been on the fence and thinking, oh, it's huge, it's a chonker, I don't know whether I'm gonna like it, just bloody read it and you'll love it. And if you don't, I'll give you your money back. No, I won't. No, I won't. Don't hold me to that. Battery change, hopefully without touching too much and screwing things up. Can you tell I really like the orange tree and the priory? Can you? Can you? Can you? So next up, I'm going to talk about a present read. Now, this is one that I tried a little while ago under pressure from my dear best friend who loves these books and from the internet in general who's always told me to read this author. I tried it. I was enjoying it to start with. Then I kind of went off the boil and couldn't really get into it. And now I've picked it up and tried again. And that is Robin Hobb assassin's apprentice now i know there's going to be some robin hobb readers going what you didn't get on with it what's wrong with you get out no shut up and i hear you i do i hear you and i'm sorry i'm sorry if you're a fantasy reader you probably know about robin hobb you've probably read robin hobb i'm very late to the party so that's yeah so she's written loads of novels and from what i can tell they're all most of them at least most series are kind of based in the same world far seer trilogy which is i believe the first series she wrote and the first in order of them i think and yeah the one i've been most recommended to read now my dad read some robin hobb as well he read the first two of the most recent series it's fool's quest and fool's apprentice uh the third one he was waiting to come out and pay back um so yeah, Robin Hobb has always been someone on my list to read. So Assassin's Apprentice, as you probably know, is centred around Fitz, who is a bastard child of one of the princes of the realm, of the six duchies, and it follows his life and he starts to become an apprentice. And that's about as far as I've got an apprentice to an assassin, I should say. That's kind of baked in there, isn't it? So yeah, as I say, my, my dear best friend and, and her partner and so many other people have always raved about Robin Hobb and told me that I should read them and I, I kind of got to that point where I was kind of again a little bit resisting it on principle that everybody was telling me to read it. I don't know, maybe I need to get rid of that tendency. But I finally started it a few months ago and I did, I did enjoy it to start with and then I don't know why I kind of went off the boil. And do you know what? I think it was because I was coming off the back of one of the Witcher books in which a section of it is one of the characters grown up, not one of the main characters, he's grown up and he's now sort of a bit of a historian and he's writing. And in that book, I found those bits so dull and boring and a drag and they were some of the bits that I skipped. And I think because this book starts off with the, the main character of these novels years later writing about his time and it starts off each chapter with a little bit of the history, I think I just kind of got alarm bells ringing and felt like I was back in the dull bits of the Witcher book. And I think it came up again a little bit against expectation as well, because there's been so many different Robin Hobb series and from working in the bookshops or seeing bits of different ones and, and some of the titles confuse me. Like I say, you've got Fool's Quest and Fool's Assassin and Assassin's Apprentice and Fool's and you've got the Fitz and the Fool. I got a little bit confused and wasn't quite sure which one I was coming into, as it were. Plus, as well, on the back of this one, it says only the company of the King's Fool, and so far he's not really had much to do with the Fool. So I'm just a little bit, again, that's on expectation, but I guess there's a level of setting it up for that expectation. If you say that his only company as a kid is the Fool, children and animals, and so far I've only really met the children and animals, I'm going to be a little bit like, hmm, what are you saying? I'm not dissing Robin Hobb. I'm not. You know who I'm talking to, and I'm not. I'm not, I promise. It's just something different, and as I say, I am relatively new to fantasy novels. They're not my predominant reading taste, or haven't been historically. So a lot of these kind of authors that perhaps I should have read, that was late, or are ones that are popular for, for good reasons, are ones that I'm coming to late with a whole heap of expectation because I've heard talk of them and I've been told that I'm gonna love them. So yeah, expectation versus reality, anyone? Having picked it up again the other night, sitting and reading it in bed, I am getting back into it. I guess I'm maybe a little bit more removed from that hangover of the Witcher historian talking about his life kind of vibe and I'm settling into it a little bit more. I will confess I am maybe finding it slightly slow going still. I'm about a third of the way in and it doesn't feel like much has happened yet but we shall see. I'm sorry. So that is the present read for the first Friday Fantasy Feast. Fantasy Friday Feast. Fant and the last book is a future read and that is The Gutter Prayer by Graham Hanrahan. And I always trip up on that name because I had an old teacher called Hanrahan and he was an odd fish. So this is one that when I was reading the first couple of Witcher books and I was getting into a bit more of a fantasy kick I was like right I want to read some more fantasy books. I was having a look online and this one kept popping up so I thought sure why not. So I'll read you this one does actually have a decent synopsis on the back. Woohoo! The city of Gwerdon stands eternal, a refuge from the war that rages beyond its borders but in the ancient tunnels deep beneath the streets a malevolent power has begun to stir. 
The fate of the city rests in the hands of three thieves. They alone stand against the coming darkness. As conspiracies unfold and secrets are revealed, their friendship will be tested to the limit. If they fail, all will be lost, and the streets of Guerdon will run with blood. So yeah, sounds pretty cool. I think the other thing that drew me to this is it sounds a little bit like a D&D party of rogues just being responsible for the world. And I dig it. So yeah, if anybody's read this one, wants to give me a heads up, say what they thought, feel free. So that's that for the first Friday Fantasy Feast. Let's do this again in two weeks' time. I toyed with it doing more regularly than that, but I thought weekly will be overkill, and I toyed with doing it less regularly than that, but I think two weeks is a good balance. I hope this will satiate some fantasy cravings for you, and that this goes down well for those that were saying, go for it, do some fantasy videos. I'm not mocking you. I don't know why in my head you sound like that. You don't. None of you do. One of you does. So yeah, that's those four books for the Friday Fantasy Feast. One thing I do want to add on the end of this video is um, a few of you have commented about the 3D printer and with the current circumstances going on in the world, how I can use that. And yes, I had been looking into um, using my 3D printer to print some face shields and I've been doing that for the last few days and ta-da! So these are really simple things that you can just print the... So this white bit here is the bit that I print and that takes about 40 minutes at the moment. I'm hopefully gonna tweak some settings and get it down to about half an hour, we shall see. And then these are plastic sheets, like uh, binder covers. I'm not doing this as a toot my own horn thing. This is to say that if anybody out there has a 3D printer and is wondering how they can get involved and help out, there are numerous ways. There are face shields, there are even some people printing uh, masks, a little bit like the N95 masks that can have replaceable filters. Um, there are people printing little clips for the back of the heads because people, uh, the nurses and doctors who are wearing the masks, the elastic is hurting their ears, um, all sorts of things. There's even people printing parts for ventilators and, and CPAP machines and aerosol boxes and things like this that just all goes over my head. But essentially, if you have a 3D printer and you want to help out and get involved in any way. I will post some links down below that I found really useful to get on board and, and do some of this stuff. If you've not got a 3D printer but you also want to help in some way, again there's loads of stuff online about people um, sewing face masks that are more for doctors and nurses to wear over the top of the N95 ones to prolong the life of those and there are also people sewing sort of headbands with buttons on again to relieve the pressure on people's ears with the elastic. So there are ways of getting involved and helping if you want. It sucks that we should even have to, that we should think about this, that, that there isn't enough PPE to go around, but if you are in a position to be able to help in any small way, uh, it's, you know, like doing all this, I keep saying, you know, it's gonna be a drop in the ocean, but if it's something, it's something, right? So yes, to those people who've been saying about me using my 3D printer, it was something that was 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 being researched and in the works, and um, I'm reaching out to local hospitals and other local groups that could make use of them. I've printed 20 of the things already in two days, which is pretty good going. And as I say, if I can get that time down, I can hopefully crank them out quicker. I will post links down below for resources that I've used. Resources? Why does that sound more American? Resources? I don't even remember. How do we say it? websites that I've used that I found helpful, I will post down below. So I'm gonna go and read some more Robin Hobb and print some more visors. I had to turn the 3D printer off while I was doing this video because it makes a lovely little <coughs> noise constantly. So thanks for watching Friday Fantasy Feast in which I flibbity-gibbit on and I will see you soon.